back row anymore after this. Thank you all so much. It was just wonderful.
president and founder of MHU's chapter of NAACP Forward Together. She is a first-year mentor, a member of Alpha Chi Honor Society. Uh, McKay was voted Ms. Laurel in 2014 and was the recipient of the Michael Henry Award for Service in 2014. Please join me in welcoming McKay Sharp. Thank you, Dr. Wells. I'm honored to introduce Reverend Barbara further because I just wanted to share just how happy and honored we are to have him here tonight. Over a year ago, or since Laurel and Heather began helping us form our chapter of the NAACP on this campus, we've been so looking forward to the day that Reverend Barber would be here visiting with us. Um, we follow him on Facebook, we go to the marches, we're at the rallies, and we even have a copy of his book, The Forward Together and Moral Message for the Nation, that, by the way, is available on Amazon. Um, and the proceeds go to the Forward Together movement and to his church. But we're especially happy to have him here tonight to rally us for the moral uh, march in Raleigh and on, the fe on February 14th, yes, February 14th, where we'll march for love and justice and head forward together, not one, one step, step back. back. Forward one together, not one, one step, step back. back. Thank you. <laughs> Nosy with other people. 
that you are, learn to be all you can be. And know that God knows your zip code and he's got a place for you in the Lights our day, 
I dream a world where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every man is free. Where wretchedness will hang its head, a joy like a pearl attends the needs of all mankind. Oh, I dream of such a world. Some of you see me on this cane from time to time, and many of you don't know the real story. When I was around 29 years old, a little younger, I found myself in the hospital, unable to walk. The doctor was not sure if I'd ever be able to move again. I battled with depression during that time. Great pain. In fact, when I came out of the UNC hospital after three months, I was on a full walker and, uh, and, 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 a, and a wheelchair for almost 12 years. So when I ambulate by a cane, it is a blessing. I actually believe that God allowed me to have some of my ability back to be able to do exactly what I'm allowed to do now, and that is serve you, serve the cause of justice. But when I was in the hospital, the only thing that got me out was dreaming. While I was there, I wrote a poem. Sounds just thinking about life, thinking about my life, thinking about what if I was going to have to go in a nursing home at 29, maybe be there forever. And this came to me, what is life? Is it to be lived for or dreamed about? Perhaps both. Maybe our dreaming determines our living to some degree, yet so much tries to kill our dreams, snatch our dreams, take away our dreams, defer our dreams, and keep our dreams from coming to reality. Maybe then we must fight for and pray for and ask God to grant us the gift of dreaming afresh and anew. Dreaming God's dream, dreaming, hoping and delighting in the things of God freshly poured out upon our hearts and minds like the morning dew, how we need it so, then perhaps if we dream right, we will live right, and then we will know the answer to the inquirer's quest. What is life? Is it to be lived or dreamed about or both? The spirit brings the gift of dreaming into the now, what God has hoped to come, even if at first, just in our thoughts, a new reality. We began to see and dream in the now what God has always wanted since the beginning. God's dreams become our desires when the spirit is at work. Men may never understand, women may never understand, but this is what happened deep in the soul place of Sojourner, Elizabeth Stanton, Mary, Martin, Megan, Malcolm, Harriet, Mother Teresa, Fanny, Lou, Mandela, what moved them and so many others despite the nightmares around them? God's dream. By the Spirit, come take a look. The cow laying down with the bear, children playing over the hole of a snake, lion and lamb frolicking together. That's God's dream. Humanity redeemed, grace imparted, pain pushed away, tears wiped, death vanquished. The hungry fed, the hurting healed, justice ruling, righteousness prevailing, deliverance complete, Satan snared. God's dream, what a wonder, what a look. Our lives are transformed when we dream God's dream. No longer will we stay in mundane movement, away with despair and life without purpose. We now rise, captivated, and controlled by God's dreams, and so it seems. Our dreams determine our living. We live because of our dreams. And in that hospital I pray, O Spirit of the living God, invade, 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 invade once again the nightmarish corners of my mind. Loose the prophetic flow into the depths of our being with God's dream so that I, so that we might live anew and afresh. It always has to be somebody that dreams Young people, not only like Langston Hughes, not only like me at 28, but young people like those 55 years ago this week, February 1st, when a group of four students, like many of you, four, just four, who had planned at Bennett College, but then from a and said, we're gonna to respond to racist violence with anti-racist love and justice non-violence. They went to Woolworth, downtown Woolworth, just four, and tried to buy soda. Young people, college students, freshmen, called everything in 
the book, spit on and beaten. The cops were called, they arrested. They went back the next day and the next day and the next day. Their parents worried, their teachers worried, but they, had, they chose to learn by doing, not just sitting in the classroom and keeping quiet while facts were poured into their bank, bank brains, but they learned and said, we're going to take these facts and take them into the street. News television networks sent camera crews to Greensboro, four of whom reported, and then 400 and beyond. Thousands of students, black and white, started doing the same thing, protesting the Jim Crow system that ate away at our humanity and our opportunity to become real friends based on equality. And all over the country, a new energy began to spawn. Then Ms. Ella Baker, who's a graduate of a private school like Mars Hill, Shaw University, said, let's invite the students to come to Shaw. And they came there in April 1960. And those young folk got together. You know what they sang? If they, if they planned to change the nation, just students. They said they were going to change the nation, just students. They said they were going to take on Jim Crow, just students. They said they were going to bring down the most, the, the most powerful system of oppression in a so-called free land, just students. They sang. I ain't afraid of your jail because I want my freedom. I want my freedom. I want my freedom. And I want it now. And out of this movement grew the Freedom Rise. Freedom Rise started in 1961, not because the law had not been changed, but because the South was refusing to enforce the law. Law had been changed, but there was not enforcement of the law. So on May 4, 1961, they decided to do something simple. Thirteen, thirteen, led by core director James Farmer, who was featured in the movement, The Great Debate. Thirteen riders, seven black, six white. So we're going to get on the bus. We're going to ride down the industry. Thirteen of them. In Virginia, North Carolina, they were harassed. They were arrested in Charlotte, Minsboro. South Carolina, Jackson, Mississippi, faced mob violence in Anniston, Birmingham. Buses were blown up. Montgomery, Mississippi, Kennedy, uh, 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 and Jackson. The Kennedys, Democrats, called them and said, cool off, just 13. And then 26, then 39. Said, cool off, cool off. Attorney General at that time, Robert Kennedy, said, I don't think the Department of Justice can side with one group or the other over disputes over constitutional rights, but it wasn't about one group over the other. It was about one group that did not want America to live up to its full potential, and the other American citizens who said, we are not going to stand for it, and they stood up. In fact, James Farmer, a young man, said to the Kennedys at that time, we've been cooling off for 350 years, and if we cool off anymore, we'd be in a deep freeze. There comes a time. And from 13, somebody say 13. 13. Just, just 13, seven black, six, six white, just 13. From 13, more than 60 different freedom rides crisscrossed the South and changed the nation because the young people refused to give up their dreams and accept the nightmares of domination. And then after that, you had Freedom Summer. Young people again, knowing they could get killed. They go out to a college in Ohio and train, and then they leave and they go to the deep south, some less than $5 a week. They, and at that time, young the students here, listen, they could not even vote. I want you to hear this. They weren't going to the south so that they could vote. Young people, uh, 18, and up, uh, 18 and up, did not get the right to vote until 1970s. This was 1964. It would be seven years later, but they understood something about the heart of democracy. So they were willing in the summer of 64 to push the nation forward. And they did it all year long, all summer long. And even when they killed Swan and Cheney and Goodman, instead of them even accepting that nightmare, the nightmare of assassination, they kept dreaming. They kept coming. They kept believing. And there would have been, there would have been a self if there had not been young people who organized and refused to believe that 
this nation could not grow a heart. Why not give you that history? Because today, 55, 54, 51 years later, I'm here to announce we need a new student nonviolent movement. And it doesn't have to be independent of the Fought Together Law Movement. In fact, it doesn't need to be adults over here and young people over here. We all need together. And if you're uninvolved, I'm inviting you to make February the 14th in Raleigh your beginning of a brand new student nonviolent movement that says we will not stand for injustice.
I believe we have it. I believe that somebody has a heart. I don't care how much tea party tea some folk have become intoxicated with. Somebody still has a heart. I don't care how much money our folk spend. I don't believe he's bought everybody's heart in North Carolina. I don't care how much coke. I don't care if the Coke brothers spend a billion dollars on the next election. I believe there's still a heart in North Carolina and a heart in America that wants this democracy to be all that it can be.
money to bail out at 0% interest, but then raise the interest on student loans as young folk are trying to go. I mean, you really want to break North Carolina? This is what they're trying to do. If you really want to break North Carolina, oh yeah, deny the president any help, even when he's right. Talk about his wife, tell her she's wrong, even when she doesn't want, uh, when she wants children to eat their veggies. Yeah, and if you really want a great North Carolina, tell restaurants, workers, that they don't even have to clean their hands when they do it. Now what a sinner we have. And if you, then if you really, 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 really want a great democracy and a great North Carolina, do everything you can to roll back voting rights and deny voting rights. And after, and oh, oh, oh. Pit religions against each other. You know, say that people are terrorists just because they're Muslim. You know, call them, say that they have a violent tendency, just like people used to say about black men. If you really want to break North Carolina, deny that we ever need to fix our criminal justice system. Just act as though everything is fine and we don't have any disparities in our criminal justice system. And once you've done all of this, have you really want a great society, you really want a great America, you really want a great North Carolina, make sure that people can get a gun quicker than they can register to vote. Oh, yeah. Now to me, that sounds like a conspiracy. <laughs> it sounds like regressivism. It sounds like a conspiracy to go backwards. Now, what they want you to do is they want you to talk about these things in terms of left, right. The moral movement says, no, 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 no. We're not in a time for a left-right debate. We're not in a time for a Democrat versus Republican debate. We need a stronger language, a language that's not that's just, just strong enough to, to handle the kind of conversation and restoration of a moral dream that is necessary. In fact, young know, people, remember where the whole left-right language, I don't use it, I don't like, because I have a hard time calling somebody right that I think is wrong. <laughs> I mean, semantically, I just have a problem with it. Right. Just like I don't call people Republicans, not in North Carolina General Assembly, because Lincoln was a Republican and he supported voting rights. Teddy Roosevelt was a Republican. He supported health care and getting big money out of politics and raising the minimum wage. Edward Brooks was a Republican, a black Republican. He supported civil rights and voting rights. Holzhauser was a Republican, a former governor of North Carolina. He supported building up the rural communities in the East and in the Far West. So out of this crowd, they're not Republicans. They are extremists who have hijacked the Republican Party. And, and this, you know, this left language, can I teach just a minute? Yeah. This, this left language, left and right, it came during the French Revolution. And they used to have meetings to discuss how to form a democracy and rid France once and all of a king. Those who sat on the left wanted to create a democracy. And those who were on the right wanted to maintain the monarchy. That's where that whole language, left, right, came from. That's not the language we need to use today. We believe that we need a movement that's rooted in our deepest moral and constitutional values. And whether you get there through faith in God, or human reason, or the Constitution, or all of these ways, we need to stand against the path which our elected leaders are pushing the people of North Carolina. Now, elections have consequences, and they would have you think that if you lose an election, then you stop dreaming because you just lost. But that's not how America works. Even when people get elected, the people must hold them accountable. Our work is not over when the polls close. The people do not simply go away. And even if a politician gets elected, they do not have a mandate or a right to run roughshod over our Constitution and our deepest moral values. But a dream right, remember Selma, because North Carolina is our Selma now. 
And remember in Selma, Dr. King didn't have the leadership with him. The civil rights movement, black and white, Muslim and Jewish and Christian and Catholic and Protestant, they didn't have the political atmosphere with them. They went out and transformed the atmosphere. They didn't have the votes when they started marching. They didn't have some election where everybody that they agreed with got the election. But as Dr. King often said, our role is not to be thermometers that merely measure the temperature. We are called to be thermostats that change the temperature. And in this moment in time, we are being called to revive the heart and the soul of the political atmosphere in North Carolina. The Bible says it like this, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. And we are raising the question, is there a heart in North Carolina today? We believe that we have seen heart failure. And we must become political defibrillators to bring back love and justice. It is our job to revive the heart. They tell me that before you give a defibrillation, there's a medicine you have to give when a heart is not working. Well, we need this medicine to be poured into the veins and arteries of North Carolina. Number one, we need a commitment in our politics to a pro-labor, anti-poverty policy that ensure economic stability for everybody. <laughs> Living wages, labor rights, formal housing, infrastructure development, fast tax reform, targeted empowerment zone, community development, taking care of our water, Number two, we need to pour into the veins of North Carolina a commitment to educational equity and demand that every child in this state, by constitutional right, is ensured a high-quality, well-funded, constitutional public education as well as access to community colleges and universities. We must demand that. We pour into the veins.
That's why we agitate. That's why we legislate. Because we must shock North Carolina. Yes. You are the defibrillation. Yes. If you don't shock the heart of this nation and this state, it will not come back to life. Yes. The purpose will not return. And so we're going to march on the 14th. Then we're going into legislation. Then we're going back to court. We're going to shock North Carolina by demanding a reversal on the attacks on voting rights. We're going to shock North Carolina until we have restored early voting and Sunday voting and same-day registration. We're going to shock North Carolina until we block this unconstitutional voter ID that doesn't even accept the student's voter ID. Yeah. We're going to shock North Carolina until we receive federally funded Medicaid expansion and ensure 500,000 North Carolinians have the health care that they deserve. It makes no sense. But in North Carolina, like 26 other states, we've decided that health care is a civil war just because you don't like a black president. Come on now. When the reality is 2,800 people, according to Harvard, die for every 500,000 people that do not receive Medicaid expansion. The 59,000 people that did not receive Medicaid expansion in North Carolina are construction workers. And 56,000 are food service, and 43,000 are in cleaning and maintenance jobs, and 34,000 in transportation, and 16,000 are in health care. In other words, they care for us and can't even afford insurance to care for themselves. That's wrong. That's immoral. And 23,000 of them are veterans. 500,000. And they've been kind of playing the race card because you know after the so-called Southern Strategy of 1968, young people, you need to read that. The Southern Strategy. Kevin Phillips, write it down, footnote it, go Google it, and go listen at that at, at that um, tape by Lee Atwater because we are in a time where one book says we have racism with no races. The people don't claim to be racist, but they use code words. And, and Kevin Phillips said in 1968, he told Nixon and George Wallace agreed with it, said we got to stop using these words. So we have to find language to talk race without talking race so we can scare white people, particularly working class in the South, from voting with black people. They said, what, what, what language should we use? Well, let's talk about tax cuts, states' rights, forced busing, and entitlement programs. And let's, and let's racialize entitlement programs. The very programs that in the 40s and 50s lifted the majority of the white community, but now that black and brown people can't have access after the 60s, let's racialize it and let's make white people in the South think that supporting these programs is giving something to people who don't deserve it. And, and, and you never have to say the race word. It's coded language. And people then, when their language is coded, they see entitlement program, they say Medicare is an entitlement, and they don't do their research. If you did the research, you would find out, yes, six out of 10 black people live in the state that have denied Medicaid, but the majority of the people being denied are white. That's right. Oh, Lord, help us here. <laughs> Three, there are 500,000 people in North Carolina being denied. 346,000 of them are white. White and poor and working poor. Yeah. yeah. We were talking today about how in Senator Berger, who's the major poll up now, do you know in the county he represents 23,000 people all are being denied Medicaid expansion, and his own county is losing almost two billion dollars, a billion dollars. Gotta call him on this stuff. We have to shock this heart. Right here in Madison County, Mad County, I heard somebody call it. <laughs> can I just be a country preacher for a minute? There are 1,290 people in Madison County that would be covered by Medicaid expansion. Now, I, 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 I believe most of them don't look like me. <laughs> I, I may be wrong. I, I may be, but I think I'm right. Am I right? And, I know Madison County has all the money you need. 
So you don't need the $24 million in new business activity that would come from Medicaid. You don't need it. Yes, it counts. If we expand the Medicaid, 894 people in Yancey County will be covered. I know in Yancey County. <laughs> they don't look. <laughs> now look, who's preaching this sermon? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Bochum County, watch this. 12,727 people in Bochum County could be covered if it would create 1,500 jobs. This is a new study by the Cone Foundation. Watch this. 744,600,000 new dollars business activity. And yet we have legislators who are blocking Medicaid expense. Hayward County, 2,579 people in Hayward County. $54 million. And I would dare say, I might be wrong, but most of the people in Hayward County of that 2,500 do not look like me. And, and you know if they don't look like me, they don't look like other black folk because I'm white, black, and Tuscaroyan. <laughs> <laughs> All of that's in me. So we got to shop today. We must shop North Carolina until we raise the minimum wage and index it with inflation and demand the living wage. People need to be paid. We must shop North Carolina until we repeal the regressive taxes that, that raised taxes on working people and gave the wealthiest in North Carolina a tax cut they did not need nor had they deserved. We must shock this state until we reinstate the earned income tax credit. We must shock this state until the heart restores the cuts of public education and until we pay teachers what they deserve, until we tell those who want to tear down our public university system, your role is not to give the Board of Governor to Art Pope, but to use it for the benefit of the people of North Carolina. North Carolina until we reject the voucher system that takes public money and gives it to private schools. We must shock North Carolina until we reject the attacks on women's health and a bunch of old men trying to tell women how to live their lives. Carolina until we reform the criminal justice system. We must shock North Carolina until we realize just and fair immigration reform. How can we say, America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and then we don't want to show grace to brown people and Latinos and other immigrants when we are a country of immigrants? North Carolina and remind her you promised to be a state where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great and the only way you can do that is you must respect the constitutional rights and humanity of all people regardless of their race, their creed, their class, their gender, or their sexuality. It's none of your business. They are your brother and your sister. Nothing more than a, a bill cloaked in religious fanaticism. 
And you want to suggest that somebody who works for the government, paid by tax dollars, has the right, based on their subjective religious opinion, to deny somebody services that are constitutional? And just because they're gay, have you forgotten that there are still people who think racism is a religion? Does that mean that I get to deny people who I don't like because they're black or they're brown? Some people religiously don't agree with divorce. Does that mean I get to deny them because of that? How far do we push this? And how dare you act like that is the major concern of the Bible. We need to shock this state yes. since they're going to put their hand on the Bible and swear to uphold the Constitution. Then we need to shock them until they understand what's in the Bible and what's in the Constitution. Yes. The last time I checked, the Bible said, Woe unto those yeah. who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights. The last time I checked, the Bible said, go down to the king's house and tell them, Jeremiah chapter 22, and tell them to stop doing evil and treat the children right and the fatherless and the widows right. The last time I checked, the Bible says to governments and nations, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was sick, did you come see about me? When I was thirsty, did you give me a drink? The last time I checked, the Bible said, what does the Lord require? Yes. To do justice, love mercy, walk humbly before your God. The last time I checked the Constitution, Article 1, it says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all persons are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life limited, the enjoyment of their fruit of their own labor, and the pursuit of happiness. The last time I checked, the North Carolina Constitution says all political power comes from the people and is derived from the people and is to be used only for the good of the whole. The last time I checked, Article 11, Section 4 of the North Carolina Constitution says beneficent or generous provision to the poor, the orphan, and the unfortunate is the first duty of a civilized state. In other words, if you're passing policies that are hurting the poor and hurting children, I didn't say it, the NAACP didn't say it, the moral movement didn't say it, but the Constitution says you are acting uncivilized. And to that, I will say, amen. We have people who are putting their hands on the Bible, swearing up on the Constitution, and evidently they haven't read either one. So we must shock the nation, shock the state with the defibrillator. And we've shown in the Fall Forward Together movement what is possible. And we've only just begun. And Mountain Hall Monday in West Carolina, you all are leading the way. Everywhere I go, I talk about how you all came together across party lines, across race lines, across class lines, and you sent two folk home who thought they were in safe districts. You didn't have to endorse them, but what you did was you endorsed the moral agenda. You showed people a dream over and above the nightmare, and people chose to dream again. And I stop by to tell you, if we stay strong, if we stay an independent moral movement, if we march on Raleigh, if we march into the courts, if we march into the legislative halls, if we refuse to give up, if like investors, we take the long view. You know, an investor says you invest your money, you don't take it out tomorrow. You let it grow. It's going to go through some ups and downs. You're not going to win every battle, but if you stay in there, you eventually win because justice has never lost. Justice has been beat up. After a while, justice wins. And I come by to tell you, not as your leader, but as an humble servant, who's just glad that in the nightmare of our depression, when I didn't know if I'd be able to walk again, somehow the Spirit of God enabled me to dream 
And somehow before I even got off the walker and out of the wheelchair, I began to dream again. And somehow the more I work with you dreamers, the stronger my legs get. I've never seen nothing like that. The more I hang around you, the more we believe together, the more we work together. It seems like the dream is just quickening, quickening my spirit. And I stop by to tell you, we won't stop until we resuscitate this heart. We will not stop until there's a pulse return to the heart of the democracy in North Carolina. We are going to reach across partisan politics and care about people. We believe in the moral fabric of our society, and I believe there's still a heart in North Carolina. Do I have a witness? Yeah. Is there a heart in North Carolina? Yeah. And I believe that those of you who are the defibrillators are going to shock this state. And then the time is going to come when it is going to be written that it looked like democracy was dying in the old North State. It looked like regressivism had won. It looked like extremists had taken over and there was no way they were going to be turned around. But then some folk in the mountains, hooked up with some folk on the end of, down by the ocean, hooked up with some people down in the south and in the north, and when we all got together, like I feel a pulse in here. You know in the movie Selma, there's a song remix. Dr. King goes against the Montgomery, but Blank, and he's, he's heard now that the president is doing what he said he wasn't going to do. By the time they get to Montgomery, a heart has happened. A pulse has come into life of Lyndon Baines Johnson. He sent the bill for the Voting Rights Act to Congress. Dr. King stands on the steps of the Capitol, right across from Dexter Avenue Church, Confederate flag wavering over his hand. But there Dr. King looks out at 25,000, 30,000 people who were committed to a moral movement then. And he says, they said we wouldn't get here, but over to our dead body, their dead body, where well, we're here and we ain't going nowhere. And then as he closes his sermon in the, in, the, in the tradition of the church, like my father, a preacher, he lifts an old hymn and he says, you know, he says, how long? And somebody said, not long. He says, how long will injustice reign? He said, not long because no truth, no lie will live forever. And then Dr. King says, I know we're going to win because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out his vintage where his red grapes are around for store. He has loosed his faithful lightning of his terrible twist for. His truth is marching on glory, 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 hallelujah. But since I'm at a college, and since I'm at with young folk, I want to remix it John Legend style. Because you know, at the end of the Selma movement, John, Le John Legend remixes that old hymn. And he says, he says it like this, one day when the glory comes, it will be ours, it will be ours. One day when the war is won, we will be sure, we will be here sure. Oh glory, oh glory, oh glory, oh glory. Hands to heaven, no man, no weapon formed against us. Yes, glory is destined. Every day men and women become legend. Sins that go against our skin become blessing. The movement is a rhythm to us. Freedom is like a religion to us. Justice is just position in us. Justice for all just ain't specific enough. One son died, his spirit is not visiting us. Truant living, living in us. Resistance in us. That's why Rosa Parks sat on the bus. That's why we walked through Ferguson with our hands up. When it goes down, we women, we man up. They say stay down, we say stand up. Shot. We on the ground, the camera panned up. King pointed to the mountain top, we ran up. One day, one day, when the glory comes, it will be ours. One day, one day, when the glory comes, it will be ours. Oh glory, oh glory. I stop by to tell you, if we stand together, black and white and Latino and Native American and Democrat and Republican and Independent and people of faith and people not of faith who believe in a moral universe and Native and business leaders and workers and unemployed and doctors and the uninsured and gay and straight and parent and retiree. If we stand together, if we lift up the most sacred of our moral values, if we stand on our constitutional values, I stop by to tell you in the remix of John Legend, oh Oh glory, oh glory, oh glory, oh glory, what a day it's going to be all over North Carolina, all over the South, all over America, if we stand together, oh glory, oh glory, we can revive the heart of our democracy, oh glory, oh glory, there's a pulse in this nation, oh glory.
Lord, if y'all bless these people, we ask you to join. I'm a volunteer. We don't get paid a dime. That's right. All, <laughs> all the presidents are volunteers. It ain't about the money helps the local brands and the national. But it's more about building membership. And you all are so powerful up here because you look like the NAACP you looked at this beginning. Diverse, strong. You're teaching the rest of the nation. You're teaching me, and I thank you for that. Young people, we need you. We need yeah. you. Yes. And so I want to ask everybody that can come to Raleigh to make the sacrifice to come so that the whole world can see, from CNN to the local stations. We're not going anywhere. Somebody said to me the other day, they said, well, you know, you lost the Senate race. I said, well, we, first of all, that may be what you say, but, you know, they had the complete control of, control of government, the worst voter suppression laws in the country, the worst redistricting plan since the 19th century. Come up here, uh, Laura. And the best you can do is a 1.6% victory, 30 votes per precinct. <laughs> And, and, you, and you don't even get 51% of the vote, 51% of the people voting against you. And now in this state, 58% of the people want Medicaid expansion, 60% say they'll accept a tax cut, a tax raise for teachers and, and, and public education. Okay, we're not losing. We're shifting the consciousness. All I want is one more round. <laughs> I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for 216 and 218 and 220. They want to try to stop it. They don't want this third reconstruction to be born, but they can't stop it. Because for some reason, God is bringing us together. Somebody told me 50 years ago, Dr. King, they told me right over there, was up here in these mountains. 50 years ago. Teaching mountain people in the, and people in the mountains how they were connecting the urban people in the city. And what happened? The power when we all come together. So I'm begging you to come. I'm begging you to call people if you can't come. I'm begging you to loose the bloggers and the Facebook and all of that stuff. I once said if Harriet Tubman could get 500 people out of slavery, she didn't have Google. <laughs> she didn't have Twitter. <laughs> all she had was a North Star in the sky, moss on the north side of the tree, and a made up mind and a 38 pistol in her pocket. <laughs> Y'all leave the pistol home for the market. <laughs> let's show North Carolina we aren't going anywhere. Let's show them that not only are we not going to be marching, but we're going to continue fighting. And on July the 6th, we go to court to fight this, this voter suppression. And I believe the NAACP, the Women's League, and students, Latinos, and, other, and churches, we're going to win. Because we're going to fight. On Monday, the 16th of February, we're going to have a people's grand jury right in the General Assembly. We're going to put the state on trial for denying Medicaid expansion. I can't tell it all yet, but we're talking to a Republican judge that said, I'll be the judge for it because I agree with where you are. We're going to have a prosecutor. We're going to make them see the faces of people who are denied, people who've lost loved ones. We can do this. These legislators, I don't care what side of the aisle they got. Y'all stay in their face. Go down. Jeremiah 22, go down to the palace. Do not send them merely an email. Get in their face. Not in an ugly way, but in a nonviolent way. And show them that as long as there's breath in our body, we're not giving up on the drink. And we're not giving up on the heart of the state. We are the hope. We are the pulse. We are the shock. We are the defibrillation. And we intend to see the heart of North Carolina come back to life again. And beat once more with the beat of justice, freedom, compassion, and love. Just grab the neighbor's hand. Lord, help us today. Help us to know we're going to make it. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. Those that came before us faced much worse. White and white and black and brown and Catholic and Jew and Christian and Muslim and old man go across a bridge 50 years ago, face dogs and beatings and KKK sure. We're not scared of a little coke money. <laughs> Surely we're not scared of some, some tea that has strange 
elements. <laughs> you brought us too far. You are letting us see a miracle in this room right now. Some of us are looking around and we don't know when we've been together like this. With this kind of unity, this kind of commitment for all kinds of time. And for that, God, we thank you. Now empower us. Take what little bit we do. Use it in a mighty way. As we engage this mass moral march on Robert. This is the heart down from Jones G. people. And as we are empowered by your spirit to shock the heart of this state until it began to beat a fresh avenue with love and justice throughout our hearts. Thank you now. Grant us safe travel. For we ask it in the matchless name of the Spirit called by many names. But you who keep us in hope. Amen. Grab somebody and say, let me shock you.